This is the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast. Real, raw, and pulling no punches on long-term stock investing. He's ready to rock your investment portfolios. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Chillingworth. Good day, everyone. Welcome to episode number 93 of the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast. My name is Chris Chillingworth. This is a podcast dedicated to my journey as a long-term UK stock investor, uh, documenting the process of turning 4K into £1,024,867. Uh, if you've been following the show and following this podcast, you'll know that I have a long-term project, if you will, a strategy to, uh, to document my entire journey to reaching that one million twenty four thousand eight hundred and sixty seven pounds i think it's incredibly important that in years to come there is some a resource that people can go to to see how someone else once did it and to establish reasonable expectations of how long is it going to take to do it and what's com what's the commitment like and and, and what can you expect from the markets as well? Because there are going to be a ton of ups and downs along this journey. And I want to document all of that. We've already had a ton of ups and downs in the short period of time that I started doing this because I started in 2019. Well, we all know what happened at the very end of 2019, beginning of 2020. And we had a stock market crash and, and prices fell 30% and many, many stocks, some of them worse. Uh, some didn't survive, you know, some stocks out there didn't come back from it. Uh, and then fast forward to 2022, just two years later, and we had a whole year of decline in share prices, where again, stocks fell about 30%. And so I would argue that the last four years have been some of the toughest four years in the markets for a long time. And to be in the position that we're in right now of still growing, still being ahead of schedule, still being ahead of where we need to be to hit that one million pounds target over 23 years from the start, now down to 19 years, I think we're doing really well. And I, I feel like it would be a fantastic thing to leave behind our monthly audio recordings of the entire journey explaining how we got there. And I'm very passionate about this project and, and where it's going. And I think it's going to be, it's a cool ride. I'm enjoying every single little aspect of it. I'm enjoying every update that we do, uh, even on the down months. And this month has been a down month. It's the recording this on the 3rd of July and it's going to go out tomorrow on the 4th. But uh, we've obviously just completed June and so we're able to, to report on June. Uh, and before we go into the actual results of the portfolio, for this month because of what I do and because of the the way I put myself out there via the podcast via my Instagram via YouTube via Facebook you know I put myself out there I like to share stuff that I feel might be valuable to other people that are is related to what I do in terms of long-term UK stock investing I, I receive a lot of emails from all different types of people into different aspects of their investing journey I've, I've got uh, members in the investment club that are in their six figures and they've got £300,000 accounts. I've got people who approach me that have never started investing before and they've got 100 quid to spare and they want to invest it. So it's a real wide range of people at different levels and different parts of their journey. And one of the common questions is how to get started. It's incredibly easy to get started long-term investing. However, many people that I've spoken to aren't ready to start doing it. And the reason that is, is because investing should be viewed as a tool for, it's somewhere to put your surplus cash. It's somewhere to take what surplus cash you have and put it to work for yourself. But many people that I've spoken to aren't quite ready to start that aspect of their journey yet. And I'll explain why. A lot of these people haven't got their personal finances quite right yet. And they need to be doing that before they start investing. So what do I mean by getting their personal finances in, in shape and, and, you know, in the right state? Well, 
a lot of people don't have that surplus cash. A lot of people have kind of saved up a little bit of money and want to invest it. The problem with spending savings and putting it into investments, one, you don't want to be touching your investments because if you start taking money out of your investment portfolio, it's never going to grow. You need to be feeding it. If you starve it, it will never grow. And so if you are taking out of your savings to put into your investments and you have nothing left in your savings, then when your pet gets sick, when your car breaks down, you're going to be dipping into your investment portfolio to help pay for that stuff. And it's just going to ruin the journey. And so you want to have a buffer. That's the first thing you have to do. You have to have a savings buffer. And, you know, it needs to be enough that's going to cover some of these kind of life events. If your pet gets sick, how much is that going to likely cost? If the car breaks down and you blow a head gasket, how much is that going to cost? You're probably at minimum going to want a thousand quid saved up. And only then, once you have that thousand pounds saved up, are you in a position where if something happens, you've got a pot of cash sitting there that you can dip into that won't affect the other things you're doing, that won't have any negative effect. Another fi- another aspect that people often overlook before they start investing or when they want to start investing is what debt do you have outstanding? Because there is a calculation there that people would probably need to make as to is it more su- sensible to pump money into paying off this debt than it is putting it into an investment? Because paying off that debt is giving you a guaranteed return. Let's say you've got an 11% APR on a loan. Well, if you're paying off that loan, every thousand pounds you're putting towards paying down that loan, you're getting a, an instant 11% return, which you can't necessarily guarantee that on the stock market. And so it's a sensible bet to pay down that debt. Another reason why I love the idea of paying down debt first is that it's going to free up more capital for you. It's going to give you more cash flow. So if you're paying £300 a month towards a loan that you've got outstanding and you get rid of it, you pay it down, uh, you've now got £300 a month to start investing with. And so these are things you really want to get in shape before you start looking down the road of, okay, I've got a savings buffer, I have all my, my debts paid down. Now I wanna now now where do I do what do I do with this surplus cash? Well, we buy assets with it. We buy and, and one of the best places to go to start off that journey of buying assets is stocks. And the reason I love stocks is because if you compare it to things like alternatives such as buying property, well, you can buy property, but you need a heck of a lot more money up front to start that journey there are ways that you can invest in property with no money down and stuff like that but it takes a heck of a lot of work and I'm talking about real graft real work you know even as such as doing your research you have to get out and about on foot looking for deals looking for opportunities property investors aren't on right move the deals aren't on right move the only thing that's on right move is not going to be a great deal for you uh, you're you're attending auctions. You're speaking to people and trying and keeping your ear to the ground on what properties might be available out there. That's that's proper property investing. And then once you've got that property, you've got tenants to deal with. You've got or management agents that are managing that property for you. Uh, it's not simple work. It's very hard work. You've got to be passionate about what you're doing. Especially at the start, when things get bigger, maybe you might have more automated systems that are running things for you. But early on, it's a very hard graft and it might be perfect for you. But the reason why I love stocks is because I don't have to do any work. <laughs> My, I do all the analysis. I love doing the analysis. So this is why it appeals to me. But my members all get my analysis. They're just as informed as I am once they have that data. And so we can buy stocks, we can buy slices of other people's companies that we know are running very successful, that have a, a, a successful track record. We don't have to leave our house. We can just simply do it from a laptop and it might take you 30 minutes a month to just keep track of it. 
to pump a bit more money in each month to buy a few shares in a company that someone else has done the analysis on because you're part of my membership. And you can buy as little as £100 worth of it. You can't buy £100 worth of property. And so when you're starting out and perhaps your capital, your available capital is quite small, you know, let's say you've got £300 a month to put aside to do something with and you've paid down all your debt and you've got a savings buffer and you think, I need to start putting some money to work now. Well, with £300 a month, it's going to be tricky to really get involved in property. It's going to be tricky to get involved in, in fine art you know, in collectibles even. But what you can do is you can get involved in stocks and you can open a stocks and shares ISA and it costs you a hundred quid typically to open an account like that and that hundred pounds is your first hundred pounds that you can put towards buying shares uh, and you can get started and there are, are, are brokers out there that offer zero percent commissions and you can buy shares for as little as 50 quid a time. That makes perfect sense then for anybody starting out with only a bit of cash, a small amount of cash to use uh, gives them a lot of opportunity then to to re to to invest in other people's businesses and take a slice own a slice of another person's company, and I think it makes perfect sense. I think it's one of the best ways to start investing, and I what I'm hoping is this podcast that I'm producing provides a roadmap for other investors that are perhaps earlier on in their journey than I am. And for people in the far future, you know, in years to come, who have finally come across this podcast and go all the way back to episode one and listen to the whole journey. I hope it provides a roadmap for those people to show them what it's like. How long does it take to get to where you want to be? What type of results are you likely to achieve? What are the ups and downs of the market that's going to throw at you? You know, what this isn't available to me. And I would love it if it was. I would be tuning into this kind of thing every every week. Uh, I searched high and low for books from successful investors that had turned tiny amounts of money into millions. And I wanted a step-by-step -step record of what they bought, what they sold, how much they made, what were they getting in dividends, you know. I wanted that and I couldn't find it anywhere. No one was providing that level of transparency out there in the world. I've never found it. I have found some books that do talk about an investor's journey, that particular investor's journey, but it wasn't in the detail that I wanted it to be. I wanted to know a lot more. I had a lot of questions about certain aspects of that journey. And so... I thought to myself, well, I'm, if I want this, I'm sure there are probably other people that want it. So I'm on my journey. And whilst perhaps I can't follow anyone else, at least I can be the solution and start documenting this sort of stuff so that other people can join me for the ride, if, if you will. And that is what these kind of monthly episodes are all about. It's all about showing what it's like to to try and turn that kind of money into a million how long does it take what lucky breaks do you need along the way or do you not need any lucky breaks can you do it without any lucky breaks what is it like to go through stock market crashes how do you react when a stock market crashes and how did how did chris do it and did he do it right did he make a mistake did he mess it up you know these are all things that i'm hoping this podcast will answer and provide through documenting this journey and I'm hoping it's going to be a very cool thing to have exist by the time we get to like episode a thousand and I'm sitting there with uh, a million pound plus portfolio and we've gone through all of these ups and downs along the way I think it's going to be a very cool thing for this to exist my kids will be able to listen to it you know i want my kids to be successful investors they're too young right now they don't really care about investing they care about roblox and minecraft but one day they will be interested and they will be able to listen to their dad talking about how he got there they'll probably be listening to the very words i'm saying now one day in the far future it's the third of, of, of july 2024 you know, it would be 2040 one day, <laughs> in 2040, perhaps my kids will be listening to this right now and they'll be on their own journey, their own process, which I think is a very cool thing to consider and a very cool aspect. And so it's time to go through the results for June 2024. 
And when it comes to investing, investing is a bumpy road. There are going to be months where we make great profits. There are going to be months where we lose a big chunk of money. And over time, providing you are investing in the right companies, and doing it in the right way, you will probably find, you should find, that when you make money, you make more than the times when you lose money. As in, either there's going to be more months out of the, tw- out of the 12 months a year, you're going to have more months where you made money than you lost. Or, if that's not the case you should find that when you make money, you make more money than on the months where you lose. Because what generally happens is we're going to have this up and down. If you think of a chart of a a price going up, it doesn't go up in a straight line. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down. But as you zoom out of the chart, it goes up. And that's essentially what this whole journey is about. It's about the ups and downs of the stock market. But overall, we should be climbing a mountain. And... That is what we're doing. And over June, we had one of our down months. We saw the portfolio value fall by £794.85, which represents a drop for the month of 2.1% for me, for my portfolio, across the month of June 2024. Now, that figure excludes the benefit of any additional deposits that have been made into the account. So... What actually happened was the current portfolio, the, the, the portfolio value didn't fall by that much. And that's because I deposited £503.74. So that offsets some of the loss from the, the overall combined droppage in share price of my portfolio, my different stocks in my portfolio. So it offsets that slightly. We also received £166.15 in, in dividends. So you're looking at £669, something or other, uh, that got pumped into the account this month. And so what we found is that with the the overall value falling by £794 and pumping 503 in, getting 166 from dividends being paid in as well, the actual portfolio value only fell a very uh, a very small amount it fell to 37,213 pounds 51 pence which is where we sit as of the 1st of July so we're at 37,213 pounds in terms of stocks being sold and stocks being bought this was a really different month to the usual i typically never sell positions the only reason we sell positions is if the underlying business stops performing that's really what our decision making process is based on what a lot of investors do but certainly beginner investors amateur investors is they allow price to dictate what to do so for example if a price is going up they buy the stock because they assume it's doing well when the price starts to fall down they panic because they don't know why they're in the stock they've got no reason for buying it in the first place and so they sell it and because they're worried about losing their money, they don't really have any anything else to go on. You know, there's no they haven't done any analysis on the stock. They know nothing about the financials of the company. They don't know what's going on with the business, and so they just sell it. And it's all based on price action. They just take, make all the decisions based on price. We don't do that because it's stupid. <laughs> it's a terrible way to invest. We look at the underlying business. We look at the performance of the company. And then we work out what's a good price to buy this company at on a per share basis. Then we look at the market and say, so where is it now relative to that? Is this a good price to buy at right now? Yes or no? If it's not, but we love the company, it goes in our watch list and we watch it. We keep an eye on it, knowing the price, the sweet spot that we're looking for. If it ever reaches that sweet spot, we get an alert or I send an alert out to my clients every every week. They get a report. That's, that has a traffic light system that tells them which ones are priced at a level that makes sense to buy them at. And so if a price falls into that category, it becomes a green stock, essentially. And if a, a stock that we really like does fall into a price category that we also like, then that's when we we're pre- prepared to buy it. That's where we're looking to buy these particular stocks. And a, a lot of question, and a lot of people say, that's great, but when do you decide to sell? Well, we don't sell just because a price is falling. In fact, we often do the opposite. So when a price falls down, we're looking at it from the point of view, is this still a stock we love? 
because if it is, this price coming down is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to make money because we love this company. They're making wonderful profits. They're reinvesting those profits into further growth. Everything that we're looking at makes perfect sense. They're paying down their debt. They've almost got no debt at all. Maybe they don't have any debt at all. This is going to be very difficult for this company to ever fail. They're doing wonderful, yet the share price has fallen 15% this week. Do we still like this stock? And we will buy that company if the answer to that question is yes. And we'll get them at 15% discount to what was being offered the day before. So we can end up buying when share prices fall, which is the opposite to what a lot of losing investors do, who end up selling when prices fall because they don't know why they're in it. And we do sometimes sell the stocks in our portfolio. There can be different reasons for this. One of them might be that the company has been taken over and we're not keen on sticking with whatever the, the outcome of that takeover is likely to be. You know, it might be a merger perhaps and we're not really keen on the merger and so therefore it's time to get out of that because we don't like the other company that are merging and we'll get out of that whole deal and we'll go and invest our capital somewhere else. It could be that a private equity or a private firm have come in and they're going to buy the company and delist them off the stock market. And so it's kind of, it's a forced sale, essentially. You can either get out a little bit early or you can just wait for it to go through and your broker will just sell your position for you because they've been taken off the stock market. And usually that's done at a premium. You'll usually make, make a bit of money out of that, typically speaking, because it's got to be in the shareholder's best interest to accept the purchase offer. So if a private equity company come in and say, we want to buy this stock, the board, their job is to act in the best interests of the shareholders at all times. That's their job. That's why they have been employed as a board. And so they will consider any offer and they have to then decide, is this in the best interest of shareholders, i.e., is this a deal where shareholders are, is this, are they getting a good deal on the proposed share price? Uh, a company might come in and say, well, look, you're trading £8 a share, but we're going to come in and we're going to offer £10 a share to buy out this company. Well, then the shareholders have to vote to see whether they agree to this deal. And the board have to recommend to shareholders do they think it's a good deal? Do they think that shareholders are going to get a good, you know, this is a good return for them? And to sweeten that deal, there's usually a premium being added to that share price at this time of purchase. And so we saw this with MGP, I think that was last year, was it? Was that 2023 when we sold MGP? Uh, Medica Group and um, a, a private company came in and purchased Medica Group and the board said, yeah, this is a great deal. They're offering a big premium on the share price. We made a load of profit on the shares that we had because it immediately pushes the share price up. You know, if you if it's trading at £3 a share and then someone comes in and offers 5 straight away, the market value of those shares is now £5 a share. And so straight away you see the market react, the price goes up, you make a load of profit on the per share basis, they buy out the company, you get the cash for the shares that you have that's automatically sold by your broker and the cash is sitting in your account one day when you log in and you need to reinvest it in something else basically. And we make some good money from that and that's one re another reason why we can end up selling some shares. And the main reason why you would manually choose to sell a stock using the approach that we use is because the company are no longer performing. They're no longer a company that tick all the boxes that are performing at a level that we want. It's nothing to do with the share price. We will sell a company if the performance of that company, the financial performance of that company, or perhaps something we can see that's coming that hasn't necessarily hit the financials yet, but we know it's going to be a problem and it's going to hit the financials. If we see something like that happen, we'll probably choose to get out of that stock. We'll sell that position and we'll reinvest elsewhere because it's no longer ticking the boxes. And that is the reason why we sell positions. I sold in June £6,094.26 worth of stocks, which is a huge chunk of my portfolio. I was sitting on £37,000 portfolio. I sold six grand of it. It's a big, big chunk. And you might be thinking, why? Why have you sold that much stock? Well, when I first started this journey, I opened a share dealing account, not a stocks and shares ISA. 
a bit further down the line, I realized I really should be using this tax-free wrapper that's a Stocks and Shares ISA. And so I opened a Stocks and Shares ISA. And at one point, that was it. I, I then every position I ever opened was through my Stocks and Shares ISA. But I still had six grand of my 37 grand tied up in a share dealing account. Now, a share dealing account is not tax free. It's not a tax free ISA. It's not a tax wrapped uh, individual savings account. It is a share dealing account upon which the capital gains, i.e. the share price is going up uh, and the dividends that you receive are taxable. And so I made the conscious decision that instead of letting this go further and further, it's time to liquidate this account, which I incurred fees on that. Um, I made some profit on that as well. Uh, so they're subject to taxes and stuff like that. And I, I lost a little bit of cash by doing this, but I felt it was better to do it now than to leave it and do it later down the line. I liquidated the stocks and turned it into cash. I withdrew that cash from my share dealing account. This is through a company called IG.com. And I, I liquidated that, I turned it into cash, and then I pumped it into my stocks and shares ISA, which goes towards my 20K a year limit. We have a, a, a threshold that we can only invest up to 20K a year into your stocks and shares ISA. Um, and so that 6k unfortunately will apply but it should be okay for this year um because i didn't have the i'm not I, i'm not quite in a position where i'm investing the 1666 pound a month limit that reaches your 20k and so i had room to pump money into it if that makes sense and then what i did with that capital mixed with the 500 pound additional deposits the cash that was already sitting in there from the previous month which was about 350 quid the 166 pound dividend that came in that i reinvested back into the pot i used all that money plus the 6k K that went in and i bought 6814 pounds 21 pence worth of shares that was a big bump of purchase this month and again, that incurs more fees. So it's been a real fee paying month this month. But again, it's a one off. I'm only going to do it once. And it's not like something I'm going to be doing anything more of. I don't have any other accounts floating around or anything like that. I've consolidated it all down into my stocks and shares ISA now. Then the question was at that point, when, I, when it came to buying the shares, do I buy the exact same shares that I held in my share dealing account am i just going to carbon copy the the whole thing now obviously you can't do it exactly the same because a certain amount of days has to pass for funds to clear uh and so share prices are constantly in flux and so when it comes to actually then repurchasing those shares you're not necessarily getting the same price some of them are more favorable some of them aren't some of them have got more expensive uh it also messes up your returns because I bought uh, one particular company. I spent about 250 quids worth of cash buying some shares very early on in my journey. And over the years, that's turned into like £750 worth of stock. That's a fantastic return. That's like a 200% return on those positions. But I sold those positions. And so now if I'm buying them back at today's price, I've lost that return. I'm still in the same position I was financially from before. That's not changed really, apart from fees being deducted, of course, from the transactions and everything. But, you know, I'd still own 750 odd quids worth of this company's stock. But on paper, I've no longer can say I've achieved that kind of return on that particular position. So it does mess up your, your, how impressive your returns look a little bit by doing this. But again, it's a one off. And so I looked at the situation and I looked at the eight different stocks that that 6K was invested in, split up between. And I thought to myself, I could buy these companies again, but many of them are overpriced. They're at a price today where I, if it was fresh, I wouldn't be buying them. And so I made the decision that, no, I'm not going to buy the same positions. I'm going to keep them closed. You know, I'm going to... I've sold those shares. They're off my portfolio. I'm not going to rebuy them because they're trading right now at a price that doesn't make sense to buy them at. 
So I'm going to take the profit that I made on those companies and I'm just going to reinvest it into opportunities that make sense today. And that's exactly what I did. And I ended up this month spending £6,800 across six different companies. And of these companies, five of them are companies I already owned. So I just added to five existing stocks that I already had shares in. I just expanded my holdings in five different companies. And I bought some shares in a, in a new stock, a stock that I liked the look of that had recently fallen to quite considerable lows in terms of share price. Uh, a stock that typically had been overpriced for a long time. And I decided now's a great opportunity. I've got six grand sitting here that I want to put to work. Now's a great opportunity to get some of this company. I didn't buy a lot. I spent about a thousand pounds on this one particular stock, six a uh, thousand pounds out of the six. Uh, but it was a great opportunity to, to to get a slice of this company that I've liked for a long time and I've um, wanted, I've coveted for a while and I wanted to buy some of this company and I did it. So so it's been a real bumper busy month because obviously 6k of stocks sold, 6,800 bought, <laughs> you know, and so my portfolio has changed in terms of its makeup, in terms of its shape quite considerably because we've lost a number of stocks from the list. We've added one new one and just kind of real boosted our position and a lot of others. So it's been uh, an interesting one. I've got about £290 in cash sitting in that account. The rest is all tied up in stock. And as I said before, current portfolio value sits at £37,213. And for the month of June, we lost in value about £794, which isn't that bad. 2% 2 drop is half the course really we get that all the time certainly nothing out of the ordinary in terms of, um, of the, the usual fluctuations of the market about two percent drop is kind of normal for a month but we are still well on track despite dropping two percent in value the additional deposits pumped in the additional dividends that get reinvested this all helps to keep the the portfolio value up uh, and buoyed and we are well ahead of our target line, the blue line that I talk about in every single episode. Uh, the blue line that populates, that shows the trajectory of where my portfolio needs to be in order to reach that million in the time frame that I'm looking for. Uh, and we're well ahead. We're well ahead of schedule. So we've got more money in the portfolio than we, than we should have at this point because... Uh, a, a factor of many different things could be that the stocks have just done better than I was expecting but also there's an element of there's been times when I pumped a bit more money in than I was planning on you know originally planning to put in uh, and it just means we're going to get to our target that little bit quicker which is an awesome thing and something that I'm very happy with and it just helps me keep track of things um, when it comes to my breakdown of my portfolio and you'll see this from my blog once I've got these figures up on my blog uh, a bit later on in the week you're going to notice that my total return has changed. And this is because I was making a mistake with my portfolio. So what I was doing is I was taking the cost value of all the shares in my portfolio and looking at that as my cost price. And then you would take the market value, so today's market value based on today's share price, not what I bought it at, but what it's worth today, and looking at the gain or loss made on each individual um, stock. And then working out your total profit. And that works out, helps you to then work out your, your returns, your profitability, your return on investment. But what I've missed is a crucial fundamental aspect of this whole thing in so much that over time, there's a number of different things that happen. One of those things is that we make a profit on shares and we've closed them. I've closed a number of shares, sold a number of shares for like all the various different reasons I've mentioned before. But this came to light, obviously, by selling six grand's worth of shares this, this month. It, it sparked a thought in me of, hang on, I've made a load of profit on these shares. This money's being reinvested. Therefore, the cost price of my current portfolio will not necessarily correlate to the amount of deposits I've personally made from my bank account into my stocks and shares ISA. Because some of that money that's been invested today, that cost price, has been achieved from 
previous gains achieved from the market when I sold the shares. It didn't come from my pocket, from outside sources. It came from capital gains, from from the growth of the share price on certain stocks that when sold, I banked that profit and used it to buy other shares. And so the two aren't necessarily going to be the same thing. There's also the situation where these companies are paying dividends and these dividends are racking up and I'm putting all those dividends back in. So some of these shares that I own, when I look at the cost price, that's how much I bought them for, but it would have been bought with a mixture of my money that I've pumped in and money from sales of shares, money from dividends. And so it's not giving me a true reflection of my return on investment, of my raw capital that I've pumped in. So I'm doing myself a massive disservice because I'm assuming that my total investment is my cost price, but it's not. My cost price should be based on just the money I've pumped into the account from my bank account or whatever source it comes from. And so I sat down and spent a little bit of time on this and I actually went through every transaction through my broker. This is through my other broker accounts as well. I had to go all the way back to the first trade I ever made and I created an Excel spreadsheet and I literally month by month over the course of uh, 20, April 2019 to July 2024, I plotted plot I plot or plotted <laughs> every single transaction I ever made so that I could tally exactly how much money have I pumped in to my stocks and shares ISAs and my share dealing accounts and all that kind of stuff and I worked out that total deposit so far is 29,000 pounds 65 29,065 pounds 84 pence to be precise which means that I've made a total return. That's, that's a lot lower than the cost price of the shares, which is at 34 grand. So I've done myself a disservice by about five grand, <laughs> which is mental. Uh, but I, that's what I've done and just didn't realize. And it wasn't until I sold those £6,000 worth of shares and then pumped the money in that I thought, hang on, I'm missing a trick here because that's not, true money from my pocket anyway I've, I'm repeating myself so uh, I am now looking at a total return at as of the 1st of July of £8,147.67 pence, which represents a total lifetime return of about 28% so far so which is I think some people might look at that and go well it's not the 15% a year you're hoping for and it's not you're absolutely right but we've got to bear in mind here that we've had 2020 and we've had 2022 in that period, which has been pretty tough. You know, we've had some a couple of 30% drops there, uh, a couple of resets, you know, a couple of corrections where the prices have come all come, come down 30, 40, 50% in, in certain stocks during COVID and then they recovered. And then they came all the way back down to almost the same level again. Not quite as low, but almost the same level of low. And now we're starting to see somewhat of a recovery from that. But we don't know what's around the corner. Maybe there's going to be another drop around the corner. Who knows? But to have made 28% in that playground, in those conditions, I think is great. I'm really happy with that. And obviously, you know, last year we made 33%. Some people say, well, how can you make 33% last year, but you've only made 28% in total? Well, that's how it works. Like, uh, if you take a certain segment window of time, your percentage returns can be wildly different depending on the parameters you're setting for working out that ROI. So uh, over the course of the last five years, we're up 28%. But if you're only looking at just 2023, we were up to 33.3%. And it's just the way percentages work. But yeah, so that's where we're at. And it's been a really interesting insight into my actual returns on this and how much I've pumped in. I made £166.15 in dividends in June. Compared to last June, 2023, I made £92.89. So there's some clear progression there. It's about an extra 70 quid's worth of uh, 
of dividends there this year, which is great. And that's what you would expect to see, because as you're adding more and more shares to the portfolio, you expect every year you're going to be making more and more dividends because there's more shares in there to generate those dividends. Uh, so far in 2024, we've received £738.77 in dividends just for this year to date so far. If we compare that against where we were this time last year, it's much, much lower. And in fact, for the whole year of 2023, we made £933.11. So we're only £200, less than £200 away from achieving what we achieved last year in dividends, and we're only in the first six months. So we've still got a whole half a year to go, and we're only 200 quid away, which means it's very likely, and I've done some forecasts, very likely this year that we're going to totally smash the £1,000 dividend target that I was hoping to achieve last year and just missed out on. So hopefully we're going to hit that this year. It looks very likely like that's going to be the case. So, yeah, very interesting stuff there. So I talked about the 28% all-time growth return on investment, if you will, which isn't particularly great because we obviously, like I said, we hit 2020, we've hit 2022, it's not been as favourable as we'd hoped. But we can look at today's, we can look at 2024's year to date as well. And remember what I said about how the, the, the percentages are wildly different when you change the parameters of the window that you're looking at. Well, let's look at 2024 so far. That's just six months worth of trading. We started the portfolio on the 1st of January on £33,344.41. The value of that portfolio now is £37,213.51, which is a difference of a gain of £3,869.10. But then I have to remove the deposits that I've made so far in 2024, which comes to £2,303. So when you take that difference and you remove the actual deposits that you've pumped in, so we're only looking at what has been achieved in terms of return from existing positions in the portfolio, we're looking at a return of £1,565.36, which in percentage terms is a return on investment so far in 2024 of 4.7% in the first six months of the year. So it's not been a particularly exciting year so far, but we're up and, and we're ahead of schedule, which is the most important thing. So I'm pretty happy with how things are going with the portfolio at the moment. I've certainly got no concerns. I'm, I know that I'm going to hit my million. I know I will. It's just a case of how long will it take? What What's the time frame? The better we do, the quicker we get there. That's basically it. If things don't work out as I'd hoped originally in terms of percentage returns, it's just going to take a few more years to get there, but I'm going to get there. And there have also been some slight developments for me this month as well in so much that uh, I've been carrying around some debt for a while that I've been slowly paying down in my personal finances. And I'm very, very happy to announce that I've finally, this month, paid off the last chunk. And this was quite a considerable amount of debt. This was debt incurred from a loan that I took out to help someone out years ago that ended up never getting paid back to me. And I had to swallow the debt myself. We're talking five figures. And I've been slowly, slowly paying that off over the years. And I've managed to get myself in a position where I could pay off the big last chunk of that. And I did so. What this means for me is that going forward from July onwards, I'm going to be in a position where I can put more money into my Stocks and Shares ISA because I'm now officially debt free. I have no debt whatsoever to my name. I have nothing outstanding. The only debt I have is I've been using my credit cards a little bit to bump up my credit limit, but I pay them off instantly. So the moment I buy my groceries through a credit card and it's my groceries credit card, it's only what it's used for. And so I buy my groceries and then I have it set up automatically that I pay it off immediately every month. So it incurs no interest. And all that does is it just helps boost your credit score. I don't know if that's really important to me anymore because I was wanting to get my credit score up so that I could uh, negotiate better terms for my loans and to get my APR down which worked. I saved, saved thousands of pounds doing that so it served its purpose. Uh, but now I've paid that debt down and I am completely debt free. I'm not really sure if or not the credit score is that important to me anymore. I've got an excellent credit score, by the way. I've, I've worked on it hard. Uh, but I just I don't really feel like I'm ever going to necessarily use it. And so I'm t toying with the idea of maybe getting rid of the credit card entirely. But it doesn't really 
because uh, I'm not paying any interest on any of it. It's not really a negative thing, so maybe I'll just keep it and keep going. But I am officially debt-free now, which is a wonderful feeling. And it then, because I'm no longer paying the the repayments each month, I now have that capital to be putting into stocks and shares. And because it was a sizable loan, the, the repayments were pretty high. And I've just been just kind of nursing through it. And it's just, it's this freedom of having a lot of extra surplus cash now every month. And being in a position where I've got savings already, and the what the the main thing that makes sense to put it into is stocks and shares for me, and so, you know, I, I've been pumping in between two fifty and five hundred pounds a month. That figure on a monthly basis is going to probably jump quite considerably over the uh, the rest of twenty twenty four. Certainly, in twenty twenty five, you're going to see me probably invest in something like one thousand five hundred pounds a month. Uh, and so that is going to dramatically change my trajectory of reaching 1 million. And I toyed with the idea of maybe I should just stay true to what I'm doing and only put in 250, 500 pounds a month and find something else to put my money into. It seemed crazy to me that, uh, like, then it comes down to the question of well, what are you doing all this for? Are you doing it to be romantic about the journey? Or you're just trying to get to a million quid as quickly as you can. And if that's the case, then I should keep I should just pump as much money into this as I can and get there as quickly as I can. And you know, maybe when I hit one million, if I get there a lot quicker than I thought I was gonna get there, then I'll change it to, you know, four K to five to five million or four K to ten ten million. Whatever. It doesn't really matter. And so it's gonna it feels like a cheat. You know, it feels like cheating that I'm going to have a lot of extra capital, which is going to boost my portfolio um, and it's going to artificially help it grow and hit, help me. So help me reach the one million. Uh, it's also relatively uh, I'm going to lose my relatability to certain people, I think, because people can't necessarily afford one thousand five hundred pounds a month being pumped into their stocks and shares portfolio. And so they'll say, well, it's all right for you. You've got that money whereas I haven't. Uh, and I'm slightly worried about that, if I'm honest. You know, I think that's, it's, is it, is it going to make it so that people can't really relate to my situation anymore? Um, but it's not going to stop me. <laughs> I'm still going to do it. I'm still going to pump that money in. Because uh, ultimately, the main point of all of this is to get my personal wealth up to a million pounds uh, and, and, and to showcase the journey and showcase the process. If people look at that journey and think, well, that's all well and good for him. He had extra cash. Uh, so be it. There's not really much I can do about that. I can't, I could sit there and pretend I don't have this money available, uh, but I'm not going to do that because it just doesn't seem like it makes sense. And I don't really know any other solution really to, to that problem. It's a good problem to have. Uh, but I don't really know a better way of doing things. Uh, I could open a separate stocks and shares ISA and keep the two accounts separate, but I just feel like that's a waste of time. I just feel like it's a race to the million, and the quicker you can get there, the better. And anybody w watching it can, say, you know, maybe it will be a an example of how cash flow is so important. Cash flow is so key. If you can, and and another thing I will add as well is that. You can't get to a million by just pumping money in. You need the market to put that money to work to reach the million. If you were just to pump money in, even at £1,500 a month, or what's that work out as? Probably something around the region of 17000 a year. If you're going to put £17,000 a year in, you're not going to turn it into a million unless you're pumping it into something that's going to grow in value. So I'm still going to be heavily reliant on the stock market doing its thing and picking the right companies and buying at the right prices you know you can't just put 70 grand in over 10 years you're only going to have 170 grand you know but with the power of the market by the power of combining all these aspects of my analysis and picking the right companies uh, of achieving something in the region of 15 percent annual average return by getting four percent dividends a year uh, that is what's going to help me get to that one million and it can only be done through some form of return on your investment so yeah that's a, a, a good problem to have uh 
but uh, and it will be starting. You start to see, notice a difference in the amounts that I'm pumping in, probably coming off next month, uh, and and it will ramp up. And then by 2025, I will be really going for it because I'll have nothing else to put this capital into at the moment. And so, yeah, it'll be it'll be pretty much everything will be going into it. So yeah, that'll be exciting because we'll see some real powerful growth i think reaching 100k really isn't going to take that long now if i forecast and look ahead in maybe two years i might be there so it's really going to happen that quickly which is very exciting um but i'm going to wrap it up because it's been a long old episode i hope it's been useful i hope you've uh, been given some sort of insight at least into what i'm doing if you've got any questions if you've got anything to say about this, if you've got, if you're on your own journey and you're interested about certain aspects of what I'm doing, if you've got any advice, any insight from yourself about your own investing, any of this, you can email me chris at chrischillingworth.com or hit the website chrischillingworth.com. I return to the format that uh, we've been getting used to over the last few weeks next week. Until then, if you're on Instagram, type in Diary of a UK Stock Investor into Instagram and drop me a follow. Um, I'm up to 62 followers now. It's a slow slog, uh, but I'd appreciate any support from anyone listening. So pop on over there and drop me a follow. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I'll see you guys next week. Cheers. You've been listening to the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast. Real and raw, telling you like it really is. There's a lot to long-term stock investing, but Chris's passion is to bring you all the information you need that's easily understood while having a damn good time doing it. We hope you've enjoyed the show. If you did, make sure to like, rate, and review. But wait, there's more. Hit the website at www.chrischillingworth.com. From there, you can grab Chris's books, the podcast, videos, free courses, and tips and advice on successful stock investing. It's been a pleasure. See you next time on the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast.